Here's a question for us. Um, are the chemical properties of an element due to A, the number of protons, B, the number of neutrons, C, the number of outer electrons, or D, the number of inner electrons? And those chemical properties are going to be due to C, the outer or valence electrons. Those are the ones that are involved in bonding. So we're dealing with all of these standards today, continuing on with our physical and chemical properties relating to periodic trends. So we have some groups on the periodic table, and we're wondering what forces hold elements of one atom of any of those elements together. Uh, just as a reminder, and we've wrote these, written these <coughs> on our periodic tables before, we can count our columns on the periodic table, our groups on the periodic table, either by skipping the transition metals, that's the first set of numbers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, or sometimes it's 8, or... We can count all the way across, and that's how the one in the classroom is. So it includes all of the transition metals. So it's important to realize uh, when you're asked a question, either in IB or when you get to college, which standard they're using. Um, these red ones here, the first two uh, columns and most of the ones in between are all held together by uh, metallic bonds. We have giant covalent bonds as we get to columns three and four. And then we have weak van der Waals forces as we go columns 5 through 7 um, and a little bit in 18 as well. And we're going to be talking about each of those later on as the year progresses. So our group names, just so we have them all straight, we've known a lot of them already. But group 1, that first column, are the alkali metals. Group 2 are called the alkaline earth metals. Group 3, icosagens. Group 4, crystallogens. Group 5, nicogens. Group 6 is chalcogens. Group 7 are the halogens. And group 8 are the noble gases. And we know those are the least reactive of them all. I know we also know that there's the transition metals in between. There are three general classes of elements. We've got the metals. Those are the ones that lose electrons. They're conductors, malleable, ductile, so malleable means that we can bend it. Ductile means we can pull it into a wire. They have a luster. They form metallic bonds, and they can form alloys, for, which means that that's multiple metals forming one uh, grouping of metals together, those elements. For instance, we have a lot of, uh, or a group that's called amalgams, and those are alloys that contain mercury and one other atom. We also have things like bronze and brass that are uh, alloys. Now metals are going to gain electrons. They're poor conductors. And then we have the metalloids right in between. Those are metallic and non-metallic in behavior, so they have properties of both. So a little bit of a refresher on alkali metals. Here's a question for us. Um, if you look at those alkali metals on the periodic table, we think about the electron configurations and what they want their electron configurations to get to the noble gases, we can see that the alkali metals are going to lose one valence electron forming a cation. Remember, when they lose an electron, they become more positive. So positively charged ion is a cation with a 1 plus charge. So A is the correct answer. They are going to react with nonmetals to form an ionic compound, that is B. And we learned about that when we were naming compounds earlier this year. Another little refresher on ionic compounds. If we have sodium reacting with oxygen, what primary compound would be formed? I would look at the charge of sodium on the periodic table. It's an alkali metal, so its charge is a plus one. And then I would look at oxygen on the periodic table. It has six valence electrons, which means it would gain two for a two negative charge. So I have N1 plus O2 negative. To get a neutral compound overall, I'm going to need two sodiums at a plus one charge and one oxygen at a negative two charge to be neutral overall. So I crisscross. In other words, that's telling me I get Na2O. C is the correct answer. But in actuality, sodium burns in oxygen to form sodium oxide and sodium peroxide. We're going to learn more about the peroxides when we get to redox chemistry. Um, and we can balance this equation. And if we balance this equation, we'll see that 
there are six moles of sodium for every two moles of oxygen, forming two moles of sodium oxide and two moles of, or one mole of sodium peroxide. The alkali metals continued. They have low density. They are soft and they have a low melting point. Remember earlier on in the year we took some sodium out of a container that was uh, both in kitty litter and then that had a container that was in oil. We took it out with some tweezers and we cut it with just a regular kitchen knife, not even a steak knife, just a regular kitchen knife. So they are very soft, even though it's just sodium, which we know isn't as soft as ones further down the column. Um, it's very soft at that point. I can cut it with a knife. So we can remember back to that to put that into practice. Each atom is only going to want, donate one electron to metallic bonding. So all of these atoms are going to be held together by a sea of electrons that are just moving around. And that's why metals are good conductors, because those valence electrons can move around. Since, though, it only has one valence electron that's going to be moving around between all of the atoms, it's held together very weakly. As we go down the group, we're going to keep getting softer, and we're going to have a lower melting point. The larger radius means that there is a weaker attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons, and so it's going to be easier to break those metallic bonds. They're all very reactive, but they get more reactive as we go down the group, and they tarnish in air, and we saw that again with that sodium when I cut it. It automatically started tarnishing right away. The color went back from the metallic back to a whitish color. And it's because they easily lose that one valence electron. So they start reacting with the things that are around them. As we go down the group, the size increases. We talked about that yesterday. We also said that the ionization energy decreases, which means that the reactivity is increasing. It's much easier to remove an electron from it. And since it's easier to remove an electron, that reactivity is going to increase. They react very well with water, very violently. And here's one of our uh, equations from the review and enhance worksheet that we had. What happens when sodium and water react? And this goes, again, back to that demonstration. We got sodium hydroxide, and we got um, hydrogen gas. We saw the hydrogen gas going off of it. We saw the possible flames at different times, and then we use some phenolphthalein to show that there was a base present, in this case sodium hydroxide, because the solution turned pink. So if we balance this out, I have two moles of sodium for every two moles of oxygen reacting, and I'm forming two moles of sodium hydroxide and one mole of hydrogen gas. The halogens have seven valence electrons and they are going to gain one valence electron, forming an anion with a negative one charge. A is the correct answer on this one. And again, that's thinking back to earlier on in this year. We know that the di they, they will be diatomic when they are not bonded to anything else. Um, that's because they are so reactive that they're going to latch on to whatever they can latch on to, and quite often that's one of their own. They're going to react with metals to form an ionic compound, and they're going to react with other nonmetals to form a covalent compound. So A is the correct answer. <clears throat> Most of the ionic compounds that are formed between the halogens and a metal are going to be white, and they'll be soluble in water. There are some insoluble halogen salts, though. So that won't dissolve in water. Insoluble means won't dissolve in water. We've got lead two iodide. So when I have the ion of lead that has two, um, a two plus charge reacting with iodine, that will not dissolve in water. Any of the silver one halide. So anytime I have a silver one and one of the halogens, that's not going to dissolve in water. At standard temperature and pressure, so thinking back, back to gas laws, what is standard temperature and pressure? Standard temperature and pressure, uh, fluorine and chlorine are gases, bromine is a liquid, and iodine is a solid, and we see that on our periodic table in the classroom based off of the colors. The periodic table that you'll get on the IB exam will not be colored like that. 
as we go down the group, they're stronger van der Waals forces holding those molecules together. But as we go down the group, they're less reactive. It's harder to overcome those intermolecular forces, those van der Waals forces that are between them, so they're less reactive. We're going to have bigger atoms with weaker attractions between the nucleus and the outer electrons, so it's harder for it to gain electrons. There's not as much of that uh, Z effective, the effective nuclear charge, able to pull electrons towards it. So, theoretically, if we had enough of them in the world, what halogen and which alkali metal would react the most readily? And um, that would be the most reactive of the metals, francium with the most reactive of the halogens, which would be fluorine. Okay, we can have halogen displacement reactions. So, which of these would be the general form for a single displacement reaction involving a halogen? And it would be A, where I have a metal, I have a halogen, which is diatomic, and another halogen that's bonded to the metal. The one that is bonded to the metal uh, gets displaced or replaced by the halogen that was on its own as a diatomic and I get my new halogen on its own and a compound between the metal and the first halogen. A is the correct answer. As we go down the group electronegativity increases so the oxidizing power in decreases and we're going to talk more about oxidation and reduction in topic 9. And what oxidizing power is, is the ability to accept electrons. Only a higher halogen on the periodic table would be able to displace a lower halogen, and that's because they're more reactive. We know that fluorine is the most reactive of the halogens, so if I had some F2 here instead of this random symbol, if I had F2 reacting it with a metal compound of chlorine, so let's say sodium chloride, the fluorine would be able to come in and kick out the chlorine to form uh, sodium fluoride. If, however, bromine was here, Br2, trying again to react it with sodium chloride, that sodium chlorine bond is held together more tightly than that bromine can kick out the chlorine. So I'm still, I would be left with no reaction. Bromine would still be Br2 and the sodium chloride will still be sodium chloride. If we look across period three, we have sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Argon's gonna be not reactive because it's a noble gas. We know that sodium, magnesium, and aluminum are all metals. The oxides that are formed between them, so we have sodium oxide, Na2O, magnesium oxide, MgO, and aluminum oxide, Al2O3, those would be giant ionic bonds, so they're going to be crystalline in structure. They're going to be solid. They'll conduct electricity when they are liquid. So we'd have to heat them up to make them into a liquid, which is going to take really high heat, and they would be able to conduct electricity. Or if I dissolved them in water, I, they would be able to conduct electricity as well. The sodium and magnesium oxides are going to dissolve in water and they're going to form uh, basic solutions and by that we mean not acidic. So we have Na2O reacting with water to form NaOH and we're missing, nope, that's right. We've got sodium or oxides um, of aluminum. Those are going to be giant ionic bonds, but when they dissolve in water, it's going to be either basic or acidic, and that would be called amphoteric. It's a good definition for a flashcard, and we have those two reactions there, which you also did on your review and enhance. Silicon dioxide is a large covalent bond, which is also crystalline, but it's not held together the same way as the ionic bonds, so it does not dissolve in water but it will react with sodium hydroxide, which is a base, so silicon dioxide is considered an acid just because it reacts with a base. And that's according to that equation there, which we saw also on our review and enhance. And then we get to our nonmetals, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. Their oxides are covalent. 
which means they are molecular covalent bonds, not crystalline. Their oxides are going to react with water, forming strongly acidic solutions. So we went from basic with the metals to acidic with the nonmetals, and that's a trend for us to memorize. So for instance, P4O10 is going to form phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Remember, when we see an H, we're going to think acid. When we see an OH, we're going to think base. Uh, remind, remember, back to when we started reactions, we have some evidence for reactions. We see a color change. So I take two colorless things, and all of a sudden I have a bright pink. That's evidence of a reaction. The formation of a precipitate, which means a solid is being formed when I have two aqueous solutions. A gas being produced, not by heating, but by putting two, compound, two or more compounds together. And then a temperature change. The most common driving forces of a chemical reaction include the formation of a solid, formation of water, transfer of electrons, and the formation of a gas. And a lot of those relate back to those visible things that we can see that help us determine that a chemical reaction occurred. Which of the following is not the driving force of a reaction? It would be C, the formation of a liquid. Okay, we have two words here. Soluble means that the ions are going to dissociate in a solvent. The solvents that we're going to be dealing with here are water. So we're making aqueous solutions. These are often called electrolytes because we have ions floating around in the water. And for instance, we have sodium chloride. We've all dealt with sodium chloride before in water and we see that it dissociates. So we put in that sodium chloride with the water. We have water behaving both as a molecule and it dissociates a bit itself. So we have some hydrogen and oxygen ions in the water. And those help break apart the sodium chloride and we get sodium ions and chlorine ions. We also have things that are insoluble, which means that the ions are going to remain bonded while they're in the solvent. They're non-electrolytic, so they're not going to conduct electricity. And an example for us would be calcium carbonate, um, which is often found in antacids because it reacts with acid, and it's the main component in shelled animals. Lucky for them, because otherwise they would be dissolving all the time. We can predict whether things are going to dissolve in water, so be aqueous, or not dissolve in water, be a precipitate or a solid, using some solubility rules. And you have this chart here, and how we read it is we look for whatever we're uh, given and see where it falls on this chart. So if I had an iodine compound, we talked about this one, the halogens with certain things, most halogens are soluble, so they, they are aqueous. But we said that the ones that have silver 1 plus ions are going to be insoluble. So I've moved from the soluble to the insoluble. Um, and so my compound would be insoluble if it was silver iodide. Let's look at a couple of examples here. Potassium bromide is that first one. I look here. Here's my bromine, my soluble compounds. I look here to see if there's an exception. Potassium does not show up here. So I don't move over into this column. I say it was soluble. Let's look at the next one. Barium sulfate. So I look to see if there's anything about sulfate. Sure enough, there is right here. Sulfates are normally soluble, but we do have exceptions. So let's see if barium's one of them. Oh, yes, it is one of them, so it is insoluble, so it would be a precipitate or solid. Our next one is lithium sulfide. So I'm going to find sulfi sulfur on here. There's my sulfur. It's normally insoluble, but it has an exception, so let's see if there, yep, lithium is the exception to it, so it would be soluble or aqueous. And calcium hydroxide is my last one. Hydroxide salts are normally insoluble, but I have to look at the exceptions. Oh, calcium is not on here, so it stays in the insoluble compound. So calcium hydroxide would be insoluble in water. 
So we need to remember what a precipitation reaction is. That's where two compounds exchange cations. So the general form would be AB plus CD. And then we have a switch. So the A bonds to the D, kicks out the C. The C can then bond to the leftover B. And then we would have to balance it. But remember, we're looking to see if a solid is formed, so we're going to have to look at our precipitation rules each time to determine if a reaction will actually occur. So here I have some silver nitrate, that's soluble, so it's got the AQ behind it, and potassium chloride, that's also soluble, so it's got an AQ behind it. They are going to switch places, and I'm going to have to look at charges to see how they're going to bond together. So silver is a... Ooh, hang on, directions. Look at the ion charges, the metal stays, the nonmetal moves, or vice versa. Determine which, if any, is a precipitate, and then balance. So my silver ooh, is a 1 plus. My nitrate is a 1 negative. Then I have my potassium as a 1 plus, and chlorine as a 1 negative. And I'm going to put these two together in one bigger beaker and see what happens. So my silver and my chlorine are going to react. I've got an Ag1 plus and a Cl1 negative. When I crisscross those, they're going to cancel out. I never write the pluses or minuses, and I never write ones. So I just write Ag, Cl, and then I look at my chart, and I see that it's solid. It's going to be a precipitate. That's that one. Halogens are normally soluble, but when it's the silver, it's insoluble, so that makes it a solid. So a reaction is occurring here. I need to look at my other product, potassium and the nitrate are going to react. Oop. So I have a K1 plus and a NO31 negative. Again, they're going to crisscross, and we're going to be left with KNO3, and that will be aqueous. So I have floating around ions of potassium and nitrate. I have solid compounds of silver and nitrate that are either going to fall to the bottom or going to be as a precipitate floating throughout the system. A reaction did occur. I can see what I need to do to balance it, and I see it's already balanced. Let's try another one. So we have potassium nitrate and barium chloride. So first, I have to identify what the compounds are. I have potassium, which is a 1 plus, with chlorine, a 1 negative, so I get KCl. And then I have barium, which is a 2 plus, with nitrate, NO3, 1 negative. So barium crisscrosses, I get a 2. I have my nitrate in parentheses because the entire group gets that 2. And then I have to look at my chart. Well, halogens are generally soluble. And potassium is not one of the exceptions, so it is an aqueous solution. The barium nitrate, there would be another soluble compound. That means that this is a no reaction. There's no precipitate form, so this would be no reaction. So I would not balance it. Don't balance it if it's not reacting. 